Uh, David Swanson is our next speaker. He's a local author and activist. He's spoken here a few times. And he's at the forefront of the peace movement in America today. His most recent books are War is a Lie and When the World Outlawed War. He also hosts a radio program called Talk Nation Radio. Of particular interest for tonight's subject, he's recently dined with the Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad during his visit to New York for the UN talks. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, at least one other person in the room tonight was at that uh, dinner, which was not some sort of intimate uh, <laughs> evening, but at least 50 or more uh, peace activists. It's an annual uh, event. Uh, I think it's something to be uh, uh, applauded for uh, the president of a country to be willing to meet with peace activists uh, in his own country or another country. I can think of some presidents who don't do that. Um, I, I certainly have learned more in the past half hour about Syria than in the past year of U.S. media consumption. Um, the U.S. media is not useful for these things. On Iran, if you look at U.S. media outlets, they talk very frequently about the U.S. Uh, excuse me, about the Iranian nuclear weapons program. Right now, the U.S. National intelligence estimates by the U.S. intelligence agencies have said for the past six years that there is no Iranian nuclear weapons program. But we have endless discussions of this non-existent thing in our media. We have endless references to the Iranian threat. Iran, unlike the United States, isn't threatening anyone. Isn't threatening Israel, isn't threatening the United States, isn't threatening uh, U.S. troops stationed near Iran. By the way, we don't have Iranian troops stationed near the United States. And the, the outrage, apparently, is that Iran has suggested that if attacked, it might fight back. Right? That is simply intolerable. And so we have these endless references to the Iranian threat. The, uh, the range of debate, I think, is as disturbing and misguiding in the US media as specific lies about Iraqi weapons or Iranian weapons. The range of debate on Iran is now pretty well limited to, to at one extreme, immediate invasion, and at the other extreme, what President Obama so proudly calls crippling sanctions, as if that were some sort of alternative. And anything outside of that range is just non-existent. So this is, this is how the US media begins to move us toward war. As far as we know, there is no Iranian nuclear weapons program. Iran is not threatening anyone. Iran does not have a history of threatening other nations. Uh, in, in fact, we, of course, have a long history of threatening Iran and of overturning a democratically elected government in Iran. Um, Iran is a victim of chemical weapons, of war, of weaponry, provided to Iraq by, among others, companies here in the state of Virginia. Uh, Iran is currently a victim, increasingly, with the suffering expected to increase significantly, of these glorious crippling sanctions that are presented as some sort of alternative to war, as opposed to what they are, what they were with Iraq, that is a step that takes us closer to war. Next, uh, next Monday over at the Miller Center at UVA, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright will be presenting herself as a victim of war. She famously remarked that killing half a million young children in Iraq with sanctions was worth it. It would be nice if someone made their way over there and asked her worth what? What is it that we accomplished with those sanctions? And would it be worth killing a half million Iranian children? And worth what? What is the goal that outweighs that suffering? These, these sanction, we're sanctioning, we're sanctioning Iran's fossil fuel energies while insisting that they not develop nuclear energy. We're sanction, we're blocking parts for windmills and other green energy alternatives while insisting that they not pursue nuclear energy. The 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 approach is is completely. Uh, contradictory on its own terms. Meanwhile, we've seen assassinations of scientists 
in Iran. We've seen cyber attacks on Iranian computers openly uh, bragged about here. We've labeled, we meaning the government in Washington, has labeled part of the Iranian military a terrorist group and taken a terrorist group formerly labeled as such by the US government and taken that label off it to allow funding and training, training which has been going on by the United States. We have drones over Iran. A drone was brought down by the Iranians and our government said, please, can we have it back? Uh, we have huge military exercises off the coast of Iran. Can you imagine military exercises in the Chesapeake Bay by some other nation or, or coalition of nations? We have bases absolutely surrounding the nation of Iran, US military. And we have a history of overthrows and assistance in attacks and threats, a history that I, I don't imagine anyone in Iran is unaware of, of the United States overthrowing its democratically elected government in 1953, uh, a, a history of assisting Iraq in making war on Iran, and a history in which it's been public knowledge for the past several years that Iran and Syria are on a list of nations that the US government and the Pentagon hope to overthrow the governments of. And we have many Congress members and senators and uh, would-be presidents talking about uh, the opportunity that Syria presents, the opportunity for war, to move on overthrowing a government in Syria primarily because of its relationship to the government in Iran. Um, so there's a different standard for Iran. There's a different standard from Israel, which is not a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and does have nuclear weapons. Iran is a member and does not have nuclear weapons. Uh, a different standard to Pakistan and India and North Korea and other nuclear nations. A very, very different standard you see applied to Iran and Syria to that applied to Saudi Arabia or Bahrain or Kuwait or Jordan any number of nations where if our government were really concerned with humanitarian issues, with abuses of human rights, we would see the support for, for movements that are non-violent and viable and could succeed. Instead, we import our top cops to lead the cracking of skulls in Bahrain because we get to park our fleet there. Uh, the, uh, the, the movements in uh, in Jordan are apparently uh, growing in response to US troop movements uh, threatening Syria. And, and of course, uh, a very different approach from what Helena described uh, with Myanmar. The difference is, of course, that Iran is independent and defiant of, as is Syria, of, of US will. And there's a lot of oil there. Threatening an attack or attacking would be completely irrational on its own terms. It right? would lead to, and many experts in the United States government and Israel will tell you, would lead to Iran actually developing nuclear weapons. The attacking, the threatening of a government does not lead the people to overthrow it. It leads them to rally around it in opposition to the foreign threat. Uh, an Iranian protester and a uh, Nobel Peace Laureate who perhaps uh, merited that award, Shirin Abadi, wrote a message for an online group I work for a couple weeks back called RootsAction.org saying, look, I, I oppose the abuses of this government. I live in exile. I don't support this government. The absolute worst thing that can be done is to threaten war against this government uh, because war could be carried out with tremendous humanitarian costs and because it does not have the effect that supposedly is intended. Uh, such an attack would of course be immensely immoral and illegal as well. It is not legal to attack a nation for possessing weapons. Were it, we should be first. We should be attacked first. We have the most of every kind of weapon. Uh, it is not legal to engage in war for any reason. Persia, the former name of Iran, and the United States were parties as of 1929 to the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which banned war. Uh, I have a book on the table 
uh, in the back called When the World Outlawed War that discusses those developments in the 1920s. The UN Charter forbids most varieties of war. The US Constitution, by most interpretations, does as well. Uh, the death would be enormous. The environmental damage would be enormous. We would see results along the lines of what we're seeing in Yugoslavia and in Iraq from previous wars, the, the incredible escalation of birth defects from the poisons we've left behind in Iraq. Uh, and the potential for escalation is huge with the war, with all of these factors uh, that were just described uh, of the interlocking hostilities in this region. There is incredible potential. So you can talk about a limited war, but there's no history of, of any nation being able to control war once begun. There's no such thing as, as predictably limited war. Uh, this, this madness that is inching us closer to war needs to be pulled back away from dramatically. We need to have discussions. We need to get those military exercises away. We need to avoid the sort of mistakes and misunderstandings that could start a war without everyone intending it. Uh, but the same sort of madness could take a war and make it into a real catastrophe. Um, the idea that there's any evidence that attacking uh, Iran or arming opposition in Syria would benefit the people there or the world uh, is in violation of every rule we know from history. From the recent examples of Libya and Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and Pakistan and Yemen, uh, going back through U.S. history of, of nation building in Cuba and Panama, Nicaragua, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Vietnam, Cambodia, Grenada, there's not an example yet of a successful, beneficial humanitarian war. So the idea that Syria is going to be the one, or Iran is going to be the one, needs substantial evidence to back it up. It's, it's in violation of everything we've seen at each of these previous wars has been promoted and sustained and beautified after the fact by a very similar set of lies. Uh, and I've written a book called War is a Lie that tries to go through the themes that, uh, that make it clear that what we're being told about Iran is a set of lies without waiting for additional evidence to come out. Um, Paul Ryan, who would like to be vice president, uh, will be in town tomorrow evening at 6.30 uh, at a warehouse or factory headquarters right across from the airport, and I encourage everyone to go and protest him. Uh, his team talks about this, as I said, as an opportunity for war. Syria is on our list of governments to be overthrown. Here's a chance to claim we're doing it for benevolent purposes. Let's seize that opportunity. But this is essentially the same mindset as Obama and Biden have in their administration and essentially the same mindset as many longtime bureaucrats in Washington. Uh, the difference, of course, uh, is that people like Mitt Romney, uh, as we had with George W. Bush, talk about these evil motivations more openly. Uh, and we are permitted to oppose them and have a peace movement. Uh, when we have a Republican in the White House. If we ever get our act together and have a peace movement with a Democrat in the White House, I will begin to have some, some hope for some change. Uh, the, uh, the policy of our nation toward the rest of the world is essentially racist because we tolerate actions that we would never tolerate here or in NATO nations. And it can be genocidal, vicious, openly imperialistic racism, or it can be humanitarian racism. But it's still racism. And our former congressman, Tom Perriello, I count as one of the leaders of the, of the philanthropic humanitarian agenda of war that needs to be opposed. I think instead we should be supporting the proposal that came out of Iran at the meeting of the non-aligned nations for nuclear disarmament. We should be complying with the Non-Proliferation Treaty, as we are claiming Iran is not. Uh, we should be working to end nuclear weaponry and nuclear energy everywhere. I mean, the fact is that nuclear energy does put you very close to nuclear weaponry. We gave Iran 
that nuclear energy. The CIA gave Iran plans to make a nuclear weapon. Uh, we need to rid the world of nukes, uh, of every variety. We need to stop arming the Middle East. Yes, Russia needs to stop arming Syria. The United States needs to stop arming just about every other nation in that region and around the world. We tripled our sales to foreign dictatorships last year. The United States is responsible for 85% or more of weapon sales abroad, while Russia is around 5%. Yes, both need to cut back, need to eliminate this practice. Uh, but when you work for the weapons industry in this country, you're not just working for what you imagine to be good U.S. military interests. You're arming the world, and you're arming nations that will later see blowback against this one. We should be supporting nonviolent movements uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere. We should be removing our forces from that region. We should be paying for our oil, and we should be moving rapidly to using less of it, whether it's found here or abroad. We should be developing green energy, and we should be moving away from this impossible, disastrous idea that we need to distinguish between the good wars and the bad ones, and we need to identify which wars are bad. War is the most evil thing we've invented yet as a species. There is nothing worse than it that it can be used to alleviate or prevent. Uh, there are things we are all willing to oppose entirely. We're willing to say there is not a good case for slavery or for rape. And a decade ago, we would have said torture. We have to put war into that category and work to eliminate it. So I, I've got a series of, uh, of books on the table in the back right opposite Helena's, which are on the left, and a bunch of yard signs, which are free. And I encourage you to put up that say jobs, not wars. And feel free to take down those uh, candidate signs that are cluttering our town. Thanks very much.